Secreta Manita Societatis Jesu. The Secret Instructions of the Jesuits. Preface. The authenticity of the leading document in the following pages, the Secreta Manita, rests on the following evidence. 1. The general circulation and credit that it has obtained. It was printed in England in the year 1658, with a statement, which has never been met by the least attempt at refutation, that it was discovered among the archives of the Jesuits College at Paderborn in Westphalia, when Christian, Duke of Brunswick, took possession of that place, and gave their library to the Capuchins. Dr. Compton, the acute and learned Bishop of London, a man neither likely himself to be imposed on, or to sanction an imposture, published an English translation in 1669. In Germany, also, in France, and in Holland, as well as in England, have successive editions appeared, without ever meeting with the disgrace which sooner or later always overtakes historical forgeries. 2. The backwardness of the Jesuits to produce any other or more authentic code is a strong point in favor of the Secreta Manita. That they are governed by rules which they studiously refuse to disclose, is perfectly notorious, and confessed by themselves. But it is not likely they would so constantly conceal those rules, except they were aware of their unfitness to meet the public eye. It is not in the least probable that they would continue to lie under the odium of a false accusation for more than a century, if they had it in their power to remove the unfavorable impression by merely giving publicity to another and a less mischievous set of instructions. Indeed, common sense tells us that it must prove impossible to preserve, in so numerous a society, so important a secret, and that, among the number of disgusted and dejected members who were continually falling out of their ranks, it might have been anticipated with great certainty that copies of the rules would, in less than two centuries, see the light. In fact, the framer seemed to have been perfectly aware of this probability, when he expressly provided that if the instructions were produced against them, their genuineness should be resolutely denied. 3. But the best assurance which can possibly be obtained of the authenticity of this document, is derived from its internal evidence. It has been well observed, that while, on the one hand, the conduct of the Jesuits has always been precisely such as would naturally flow from the rules of the Secreta Manita, so these instructions must naturally have tended to produce just such scenes as the history of the society constantly exhibits. What is the one grand principle of the instructions? Intrigue? And what has been the character of the Jesuits everywhere, and at every period? That of the most restless intriguers. What is the end which these instructions have constantly in view? to gain power, the acquisition of which has ever been the first object with this society. What, too, is the most disgusting characteristic of this code? Certainly, the utter carelessness and contempt with which it sets at naught the first principles of morals, which is notoriously the great and leading crime charged upon Jesuitism by the general voice of history. Anyone unacquainted with the history or the character of Jesuitism might not unnaturally or irrationally object, that the fact of the government of a large society of persons professing themselves Christians, by such principles as those avowed in the Secreta Manita, is in itself incredible, and ought not to be for an instant received without the most ample proof. Even a slight perusal of the annals of modern Europe will suffice, not only to remove this objection, but to convert it into an argument for the authenticity of the document. Instead of the rules therein contained being inconsistent with the creed of this religious association, they are absolutely needed to furnish some explanation of the otherwise unaccountable treatment which the Jesuits have, all over Europe, experienced. The Secreta Manita, is the only key to the singular and mysterious history of the society. Without it, how inexplicable the conduct of almost every Catholic king, and every Catholic people in Europe. Is it not passing strange, that a select body of men possessed of learning, industry, knowledge of affairs, influence, and wealth, and devoting, as they professed to do, all these talents solely to the greater glory of God, should become objects of general prescription among Christian kings and Christian nations, and that this enmity, too, should not be founded on any religious heresy or obnoxious doctrines, for Roman Catholic states and sovereigns have been foremost in the expulsion of these, the most active servants of the Church, and the greatest enemies of heresy. To what are we to ascribe, not only their banishment from England in 1606, but the check given to the society about the same time by the Emperor Charles V, the greatest enemy of the Reformation, or its prescription in 1606? Or how are we to account for its expulsion from Portugal, 
in 1789, from France, in 1764, from Spain and Sicily, in 1767, and its total suppression by Pope Clement XIV, in 1773. A glance at the Secretum Anita sufficiently explains all these events. For if we consult the records of those periods, we shall observe, in the charges brought against the society, how exactly its members conformed themselves to these instructions. Thus, when we find the clergy of Rome complaining to Pope Pius IV, that the Jesuits increased the revenues of their colleges daily, at the expense of the clergy, and that if His Holiness should not repress their cupidity, they would eventually seize all the parishes of Rome, we only see how correctly they followed the seventh rule of chapter. 3 in which they are instructed how to grasp the whole government of the church, in order that the people might become vassals to them. And when we read the complaints of the Emperor of Japan, for even to that distant country had their intrigues extended, that under pretense of teaching the way of salvation, they had united his subjects against himself, and taught them treason instead of religion, a charge which was echoed from every kingdom of Europe, we only learn, how fully the members of the society must have entered into the spirit of those rules which instruct them so to insinuate themselves into the minds of the people as to lay them under the greatest obligation, and thus to wheel the populace into an affection for the society, while magistrates are to be so far gained over as to be ready at their beck to sacrifice even the nearest relations, and that thus, in short, those who do not love them, may be made to fear them. Indeed, the whole system of Jesuitism, as it is portrayed in this brief manual, cannot be described in more forcible language than that used by the Parliament of Paris, who erected a column in commemoration of a plot, which they declared to have sprung from the pestilent heresy of that pernicious sect the Jesuits, who, concealing the most abominable crimes under the guise of piety, had publicly taught for the assassination of kings, and attempted the life of Henry IV. It is sufficiently clear that those who could acknowledge the perfect contempt of all moral principle exhibited in the Secreta Moneta, and in the rules they laid down, that everything was lawful for the advancement of the society, could not be expected to stop short at any obstacle, or to hesitate forcibly to remove it. We are prepared for conspiracy and assassination from men acting upon these instructions. And, on the other hand, it is not to be supposed that men convicted of designs and attempts such as those recorded in French history, could be slandered, or wrongfully accused by the inferences which appear evident from the Secreta Moneta. There are also appended to this little volume several other documents of less extent and importance, but which may be useful as furnishing strong proofs of the identity of views and principles, at least, of the Roman Catholics generally, with the Jesuits in particular. In fact, the principal distinction seems to be, that the Jesuits are a select body of men singled out and associated for the purpose of carrying into constant and vigorous operation all those encroaching and dangerous principles which the heads and leaders of popery have always supported, but which they cannot safely call upon the great body of their adherents publicly to profess and make the rule of their conduct. From these documents, which are principally official acts of the Roman see, we gather the following principles, which appear to be undeniably recognized and promulgated by this infallible authority. 1. That there is no salvation out of the pale of the Roman Catholic Church, and that all Protestants are in a state of perdition. Upon this point we have the constitution of Boniface VIII, strengthened by the approval of a council, page 102. We have the same principle asserted by another pope, page 103, and fully sanctioned, in the present day, by the four Romish Archbishops of Ireland, page 110. 2. That Roman Catholics will not tolerate the profession of any other faith, in any place where they have the power of prohibition. This is declared by the late Pope, Pius VII, page 108, and by the whole of the Romish hierarchy of the Netherlands, page 130, and also by Bishop Doyle, page 109. 3. That on the contrary they will extirpate, and destroy heretics of every description, whenever it is in their power. So teaches Cardinal Bellarmine, page 107, and Pope Urban VIII, page 112, such too, is the oath of every Roman Catholic bishop, page 119, and on the same principle are the Papists of Ireland now conspiring, as we are informed by Mr. Plunkett, page 127. 4 that the establishment of the supremacy of the Pope over all kings or other governors, is their constant aim and endeavor. 
This supremacy is claimed by the bull against Elizabeth, page 103, and that of Urban VIII, page 112. It is also defended by Paul V, page 111, and by the nuncio, Delini, page 113, the letter of the last mentioned being dated little more than fifty years back, and even at the present moment the principle is defended by Bishop Milner, page 117. 5. That dissimulation and concealment of their real intentions, are thought justifiable and expedient by Roman Catholics, and that they hold solemn promises to be only binding while convenient, and even oaths to be open to commutation by the priesthood. These points are observable in Cardinal Bellamine's Council, page 107, in Bishop Lanigan's Apology, page 122, in the Jesuits' Oath, page 121, and in the Conduct of the Irish Priests, page 128. 6. That no oath is considered binding, which in any way interferes with the interests of the Romish Church, and that all oaths or pledges given to Protestants, are, ipso facto, null and void. This principle is sanctioned by Popes Martin V, Urban VI, Innocent III, Alexander III, and Gregory IX, and by the Council of Constance, and the Third Lateran Council, page 101-2, also by the late Pope, Pius VIII, page 108, and by the Legate, Galini, page 116. 7. That the degree of tolerance which Protestants enjoy in some continental states, is contrary to the wishes of the Papists, but is considered by them a grievance, which they are anxious to remove. We find Dr. Doyle lamenting the want of a coercive authority in Germany and England, page 109. We see also the Cardinal Archbishop of Toulouse endeavouring to recall the ancient persecuting ecclesiastical discipline in France, page 131, and in Spain the heads of the Church are actively endeavouring to effect the revival of the Inquisition. 8. That the hopes of the Papists of Great Britain are fixed upon the actual re-establishment of the Romish Church in this country, upon the ruins of the Protestant religion, that for this they will never cease to labour, and that they will never be satisfied with anything short of it. These views we find in their refusal to give pledges not to attempt the overthrow of the Protestant Church, in their open declaration that they challenge possession of the Ark, and in their confidence of the speedy destruction of Protestantism, a prophecy of the speedy extirpation of which from Ireland, they have lately circulated to a great extent. A few conclusions bearing upon the great question of the admission of Roman Catholics to political power, seem naturally to flow out of the facts here brought together. We observe a powerful and ever active party, who, in one division of the empire, greatly preponderate, and who are no inconsiderable minority in the whole population of the United Kingdom. We see, also, that this numerous party possesses more unity of feeling and purpose than the opposing body of Protestants, and has also the advantage of being more entirely swayed and effectively brought into action by those who take the lead in it. We find, in the next place, that these leaders openly express their feeling, that they have been wrongfully deprived of the possession of the ecclesiastical establishments, that they ardently desire to overthrow the Protestant Church, which they consider an usurpation, and that they really indulge hopes of the speedy approach of that event. We next observe, that the operation of interest, one of the most powerful of motives, is seconded by another very peculiar incitement, that of religious intolerance. All Protestants being declared objects of abhorrence, whose destruction is certain, except that they are acclaimed by the Catholic Church, and whose extermination is a most sacred duty, whenever and wherever, it can be safely attempted. A recollection, too, is here suggested, that the present demands of the Roman Catholics, the tone which they adopt, and the hopes which they betray, have altogether arisen out of the concessions already made to them, each of which has visibly added to their power, and excited their expectations, until at last they all but insist upon that full admission to political power, which would place the re-establishment of their church almost within their reach, and proportionably increase their eagerness, and augment their means of attack. We are next reminded that our antagonists hold as part of their religion, principles which render it impossible for them to be trusted. They believe in the infallibility of popes and councils, or they are not Roman Catholics. And if they believe popes and councils to be infallible, they must adopt the principles so often promulgued by these unerring guides, that no oath is of any validity, if it be to the advantage of heretics, and that every engagement, however solemn, by which the Catholic Church can in any way suffer, is ipso facto, null and void. 
Some persons calling themselves Roman Catholics have disclaimed this doctrine. But legislation cannot proceed upon the unauthorized declaration of a few individuals. If the principles of any body of men are to be discovered at all, it must be by reference to those authorities which that body unanimously recognizes. Besides which, it is plain that such a disclaimer must be utterly worthless, for either it is made by men who reject the authority of the popes and councils, and are therefore in no sense Roman Catholics, or else it comes from persons who bow to those powers, and receive their decisions, by which these doctrines are established, and are therefore only anxious to prove how fully they have imbibed the spirit of them, by publicly dissembling for the benefit of the Church. It is not difficult to foresee, that the opening the doors of Parliament to Papists, would be the admission to the House of Commons of not less than one hundred of that party. Ireland, and the Catholic English peers, would hardly fail to return that number. And is it possible that any friend to the Church of England can wish the introduction into the legislature of such a body of determined, and inveterate enemies, of such a number of men, whose leading object would constantly be, the re-establishment of popery? Or is it true that any who honestly oppose the present ecclesiastical establishment, would gladly accept the assistance of such allies in working her overthrow, overlooking the certainty that the papists would take care not to abolish the institution, but to remodel it, not to destroy the church, but to make it a popish church, an alternative which the dissenters of 1688 thought so alarming, that they came forward with alacrity to support the church itself, rather than quietly see it taken possession of by papists. But, to return to the immediate subject before us, we cannot avoid regarding the re-establishment of the Jesuits, and the apparent friendship subsisting between that dangerous body, and the Roman Catholics in general, as a sign betokening anything rather than an improvement in the principles and views of Papists. In former days this crafty and undermining society was the object of a common prescription in all the Catholic countries, and was dissolved by the head of the Romish Church. It is now again called into being by the pontiff himself, and is helped forward by all devoted Catholics. From what has this change arisen? What have the Jesuits been in former days? To turn back to the event which is most prominent in their early history, let us recall to mind the decision of the University of Paris, who, in December, 1594, passed an act, banishing the Jesuits, as corruptors of youth, disturbers of the public repose, and enemies of the king and the state. At the same time Chatel, for attempting the life of Henry IV, and Guéret, who had instructed and induced him to undertake this treasonable design, were banished. And it was ordered that the house of Chatel should be razed to the ground, and a column erected on the spot, the inscription on which described the attempt as a detestable parricide, springing from the pestilent heresy of that pernicious sect the Jesuits, who, concealing the most abominable crimes under the guise of piety, have publicly taught the assassination of kings, and attempted the life of Henry IV. It proceeded to state, that Chatel had been instructed in this school of impiety, and that the Parliament had expelled this new race of dangerous and superstitious characters, who disturbed the state, and at whose instigation this abominable parricide had been undertaken. On the point of integrity, and good faith, there are abundant proofs of their contempt of both. Take the following. In 1631, after their return, they had a controversy with the clergy of Paris, respecting certain noxious publications which had lately appeared, written by Jesuits. They denied publicly that the works in question were written by any of their members. To which the clergy replied, that their arts of equivocation and mental reservation enabled them to avow and disavow the same thing, a signal instance of which was the denial in question, since, a few years after the publication of those very works, the Jesuit, Allegham, had, in his new catalogue of their own writers, approved by the general of the society, expressly ascribed those works to the writers named. These occurrences took place in France. In Bohemia, the states banished them forever from the kingdom, declaring that it was because they incited assassins to murder kings, interfered with affairs of state, and were the authors of all the miseries of Bohemia. In Portugal, the king issued in 1759, a manifesto containing the following passages. It cannot be, says he, but that the licentiousness introduced by the Jesuits, of which the three grand features are falsehood, murder, and perjury, should give a new character to the morals of the externi, as the Jesuits call those who are not of their order, as well as to the internal government of the nostri, or their own body. In fact, 
these religious have introduced into Christian and civil society, those perverted dogmas, which render murder innocent, which sanctify falsehood, authorize perjury, deprive the laws of their power, destroy the submission of subjects, allow individuals the liberty of calumniating, killing, lying, and forswearing themselves, as their advantage may dictate, which remove the fear of divine and human laws, and permit a man to redress his own grievances, without applying to the magistrate. And it is easy to see, without much penetration, that Christian and civil society could not thus subsist without a miracle. It was to be expected, that such pernicious maxims would most effectually dissolve the strongest bonds which could be formed, for preserving the commerce and union of mankind, that they would involve the, the world in continual opposition of sentiment and of interests, and excite perpetual and irreconcilable discord, instead of that harmony, without which, human society must lose its consistency and security. On the other hand, these religious, in order to promote the union and solidity of the nose tri, or their own society, establish a sovereign government, so despotic and absolute, that the provincials themselves cannot retard the execution of the general's orders by delay, or any other means. These provincials, far from being able to communicate to those who are dependent upon them, the laws which regulate their decisions, are compelled, on the contrary, to conceal them with care, all the subjects of the provincials, from the novices to the professors of all the four vows, having no right to demand a sight of these secret laws, nor to require to be informed of the crimes for which they are punished, or even banished. They are not even allowed to make the slightest reflection on these mysterious laws, they can never, in any way, avoid obedience to the orders of their superiors, however mortifying or opposed to their own opinions, without either exposing themselves to the severest chastisements, or being dismissed without remedy. The result has been, that, while the Jesuits have been able to introduce discord and disorder into the ranks of their opponents, they have themselves been all subordination to superiors, and union among each other, being held together by the cooperation of all their members under one great head, for the support of whose authority they are mutually pledged, and proposing to themselves, as their principal end, the erection of their own society, upon the ruin and destruction of every other. And what, to return to the question, is to account for the re-establishment of this so long dreaded and detested order. No change is even pretended to have taken place in their system, or their principles. What they have been, that they are still. The most crafty, subtle, and dangerous conspirators, terrible when possessed of power, meek, quiet, courteous, laborious, assiduous, reckless of labor and regardless of moral obstacles, when only aiming at the possession of power. This is their present position in this country. They rather conceal than display the progress they are making, and yet they are advancing with rapid strides. They affect few external distinctions, and yet they fail not to preserve faithfully all the machinery of their plans. Having fixed themselves in a spot selected for its congeniality to their views, and in some measure secluded from the notice of the country at large, they are silently but rapidly leavening the north of England. From this station they extend their influence over Ireland, on the one hand, and erect, on the other, numerous posts and seminaries in the south and midland counties of England. A few years' perseverance will partly develop their plans, but not till the moment for their execution has arrived. Meanwhile we are desired to believe that the spirit of popery had been entirely changed, and Jesuitism itself become innoxious and this upon no other ground than the peaceable behavior of those whom the experience of centuries has proved to be the most perfect dissemblers, and in whom any other than quiet and peaceable conduct would entirely frustrate their ultimate views and designs. We are here forcibly reminded of the late policy of the French ministry, over which the Jesuits are known to exercise considerable influence, in the commencement of their late operations against Spain. They collected a considerable force on the Spanish frontier, and declared their purpose to be simply and solely the protection of their territory from the yellow fever. They augmented it, and still to the inquiries of the Spanish ministry they replied that they had in view the yellow fever alone. They raised it to 100,000 men. And still the yellow fever was the only ground. Nay, so far did they carry this impudent deceit as to be highly offended if any doubt was expressed of their pacific and honorable intentions. But, when the moment for action was thought to have arrived, not a word was heard further of the yellow fever. At once this formidable force, which but yesterday bore no other name than a sanitary cordon, unfurls its banners, enters Spain, and re-establishes the absolute monarchy. 
Now we say nothing of the propriety or impropriety, the justice or injustice, of this invasion. We insist, at present, only on the consummate and long-continued system of deceit which preceded it. And those who can believe that no dissimulation was used in this transaction, but that the very 100,000 men who afterwards so effectually operated against the liberals of Spain, were really and honestly brought together on the frontiers to war upon the yellow fever alone, may certainly, with as little difficulty satisfy themselves that the re-establishment of a Jesuit colony in this country has no other and more extensive object than the mere education of a number of schoolboys for the common occupations of life. But it would be scarcely more absurd in the governor of a fortified town to permit an armed force quietly to form their lines and erect their batteries without molestation, merely because they used civil language, and deferred offensive measures till their preparations were completed, than it is in Protestants to shut their eyes to the real nature of the proceeding of Jesuits, their regular progression in influence and power, their secret missions, their privately conveyed correspondence, and their peculiar discipline, by which many hundreds of young men are laboriously and assiduously trained in the most elaborate methods of systematic conspiracy. Secreta Manita. Societatis Jesu. The Secret Instructions. Of the Jesuits. Chapter 1. How the society must behave themselves when they begin any new foundation. 1. It will be of great importance, for the rendering our members agreeable to the inhabitants of the place where they design their settlement, to set forth the end of the society, in the manner prescribed by our statutes, which lay down, that the society ought as diligently to seek occasions of doing good to their neighbors, as to themselves, wherefore, let them with humility discharge the meanest offices in the hospitals, frequently visit the sick, the poor, and the prisoners, and readily and indifferently take the confessions of all, that the novelty of such uncommon and diffusive charity, may excite in the principal inhabitants, an admiration of our conduct, and forcibly draw them into an affection for us. 2. Let it be remembered by all, that the privilege to exercise the ministry of this society, must be requested in a modest and religious manner, and that they must use their best endeavors to gain chiefly the favor of such ecclesiastics and secular persons, of whose authority they may stand in need. 3. Let them also remember to visit distant places, where, having remonstrated the necessities of the society, they shall readily receive the most inconsiderable arms, which afterwards being bestowed on other objects, may edify those which are as yet unacquainted with our society, and stir them up to a greater liberality to us. 4. Let all seem as though they breathe the same spirit, and consequently learn the same exterior behavior, that by such an uniformity in so great a diversity of men, all may be edified, but if any obstinately persist in a contrary deportment, let them be immediately dismissed, as dangerous persons, and hurtful to the society. 5. At their first settlement, let our members be cautious of purchasing lands, but if they happen to buy such as are well situated, let this be done in the name of some faithful and trusty friend and that our poverty may have the more colorable gloss of reality, let the purchases, adjacent to the places wherein our colleges are founded, be assigned by the provincial to colleges at a distance, by which means, it will be impossible that princes and magistrates can ever attain to a certain knowledge what the revenues of the society amount to. 6. Let no places be pitched upon by any of our members, for founding a college, but opulent cities, the end of the society being the imitation of our blessed Saviour, who made his principal residence in the metropolis of Judea, and only transiently visited the less remarkable places. 7. Let the greatest sums be always extorted from widows, by frequent remonstrances of our extreme necessities. 8. In every province, let none but the principal be fully apprised of the real value of our revenues, and let what is contained in the treasury of Rome be always kept as an inviolable secret. 9. Let it be publicly remonstrated, and everywhere declared by our members in their private conversation, that the only end of their coming there was, for the instruction of youth, and the good and welfare of the inhabitants, that they do all this without the least view of reward, or respect of persons, and that they are not an encumbrance upon the people, as other religious orders constantly are. Chapter 2. In what manner the society must deport, that they may work themselves into, and after that preserve a familiarity with princes, noblemen, and persons of the greatest distinction. 1. Princes and persons of distinction everywhere must by all means be so managed, that we may have their ear, and that will easily secure their hearts, by which way of proceeding, 
all persons will become our creatures, and no one will dare to give the society the least disquiet or opposition. 2. That ecclesiastical persons gain a great footing in the favor of princes and noblemen, by winking at their vices, and putting a favorable construction on whatever they do amiss, experience convinces, and this we may observe in their contracting of marriages with their near relations and kindred, or the like. It must be our business to encourage such, whose inclination lies this way, by leading them up in hopes, that through our assistance they may easily obtain a dispensation from the Pope, and no doubt he will readily grant it, if proper reasons be urged, parallel cases produced, and opinions quoted which countenance such actions, when the common good of mankind, and the greater advancement of God's glory, which are the only end and design of the society, are pretended to be the sole motives to them. 3. The same must be observed, when the prince happens to engage in any enterprise, which is not equally approved by all his nobility, for in such cases, he must be egged on and excited, whilst they, on the other hand, must be dissuaded from opposing him, and advised to acquiesce in all his proposals, but this must be done only in generals, always avoiding particulars, lest, upon the ill-success of the affair, the miscarriage be thrown upon the society. And should ever the action be called in question, care must be taken to have instructions always ready, plainly forbidding it, and these also must be backed with the authority of some senior members, who being wholly ignorant of the matter, must attest upon oath, that such groundless insinuations are a malicious and base imputation on the society. 4. It will also very much further us in gaining the favor of princes, if our members artfully worm themselves, by the interest of others, into honorable embassies to foreign courts in their behalf, but especially to the Pope and great monarchs, for by such opportunities, they will be in a capacity both to recommend themselves and their society. To this end therefore, let none but those zealous for our interest, and persons well versed in the schemes and institution of the society, be ever pitched upon for such purposes. 5. Above all, due care must be taken to curry favor with the minions and domestics of princes and noblemen, whom by small presents, and many offices of piety, we may so far bias, as by means of them to get a faithful intelligence of the bent of their master's humors and inclinations, thus will the society be the better qualified to chime in with all their tempers. 6. How much the society has benefited from their engagements in marriage treaties, the houses of Austria and Bourbon, Poland and other kingdoms, are experimental evidences. Wherefore let such matches be with prudence picked out, whose parents are our friends, and firmly attached to our interests. 7. Princesses and ladies of quality are easily to be gained by the influence of the women of their bedchamber, for which reason, we must by all means pay a particular address to these, for hereby there will be no secrets in the family, but what we shall have fully disclosed to us. 8. In directing the consciences of great men, it must be observed, that our confessors are to follow the opinion of those who allow the greater latitude, in opposition to that of other religious orders, that, their penitents being allured with the prospect of such freedom, may readily relinquish them, and wholly depend upon our direction and counsel. 9. Princes, prelates, and all others who are capable of being signally serviceable to the order, must be favored so far as to be made partakers of all the merits of the society, after a proper information of the high importance of so great a privilege. 10. Let these notions be cautiously and with cunning instilled into the people, that this society is entrusted with a far greater power of absolving, even in the nicest cases of dispensing with fasts, with paying and demanding of debts, with impediments of matrimony, and other common matters, than any other religious order, which insinuations will be of such consequence, that many of necessity must have recourse to us, and thereby lay themselves under the strictest obligations. 11. It will be very proper to give invitations to such to attend our sermons and fellowships, to hear our orations, and declamations, as also to compliment them with verses and theses, to address them in a genteel and complacent manner, and at proper opportunities to give them handsome entertainments. 12. Let proper methods be used to get knowledge of the animosities that arise among great men, that we may have a finger in reconciling their differences, for by this means, we shall gradually become acquainted with their friends and secret affairs, and of necessity engage one of the parties in our interests. 13. But should discovery happen to be made, that any person serves either king or prince, who is not well affected towards our society, no stone must be left unturned by our members, or, which is more proper, some other, to induce him by promises, favors, and preferments, 
which must be procured for him under his king or prince, to entertain a friendship for, and familiarity with us. 14. Let all be very cautious of recommending or preferring such as have been any way dismissed from the society, but especially those who of their own accord have departed from it, for let them disguise it ever so cunningly, nevertheless they always retain an implacable hatred against our order. 15. Finally, let all with such artfulness gain the ascendant over princes, noblemen, and the magistrates of every place, that they may be ready at our beck, even to sacrifice their nearest relations, and most intimate friends, when we say it is for our interest and advantage. Chapter 3. How the society must behave themselves towards those who are at the helm of affairs, and others who, although they be not rich, are notwithstanding in a capacity of being otherwise serviceable. 1. All that has been before mentioned, may in great measure be applied to these, and we must also be industrious to procure their favour against every one that opposes us. 2. Their authority and wisdom must be courted, for obtaining several offices to be discharged by us, we must also make a handle of their advice with respect to the contempt of riches, though at the same time, if their secrecy and faith may be depended on, we may privately make use of their names, in amassing temporal goods for the benefit of the society. 3. They must be also employed in calming the minds of the meaner sort of people, and in wheedling the aversions of the populace into an affection for our society. 4. As to bishops, prelates, and other superior ecclesiastics, they must be importuned for such things only as shall appear necessary, and even for these, with a proper regard to the diversity of our occasions, and the tendency of their inclinations to serve us. 5. In some places, it will be sufficient if we can prevail with the prelates and curates, to cause those under them only to bear a reverence to our order, and that they themselves will be no hindrance to us in the discharge of our ministry. In others, where the clergy are more predominant, as in Germany, Poland, and Amp, c. They must be addressed with the profoundest respect, that by their and the prince's authority, monasteries, parishes, priories, patronages, foundations of masses, and religious places may be drawn into our clutches, and this is no hard matter to be obtained, in those places where Catholics are intermixed with heretics and schismatics. And for the better effecting of this, it will be of great importance to remonstrate to these prelates the prodigious advantage and merit there will be in changes of this sort, which can hardly be expected from priests, seculars, and monks. But should they be prevailed upon, their zeal must then be rewarded with public commendations, and the memory of the action transmitted in writing to latest posterity. 6. In prosecution of the same end, we must engage such prelates to make use of us both for confessors and counsellors, and if they at any time aim at higher preferment from the see of Rome, their pretensions must be backed with such strong interest of our friends in every place, as we shall be almost sure not to meet with a disappointment. 7. Due care must be also taken by such of our members who have intercourse with bishops and princes, that the society, when these found either colleges or parochial churches, may always have the power of presenting vicars for the cure of souls, and that the superintendent of the place for the time being be appointed curate, to the end we may grasp the whole government of the church, and its parishioners by that means become such vassals to us, that we can ask nothing of them, that they will dare to deny us. 8. Wherever the governors of academies hamper our designs, or the Catholics or heretics oppose us in our foundations, we must endeavour by the prelates to secure the principal pulpits, for by this means, the society at least may some time or other have an opportunity of remonstrating their wants, and laying open their necessities. 9. The prelates of the church, above all others, must be mightily caressed when the affair of canonization of any of our members is upon the foot, and at such a time, letters by all means must be procured from princes and noblemen, by whose interest the matter may be promoted at the court of Rome. 10. If ever it happen that prelates or noblemen are employed in embassies, all caution must be taken to prevent them from using any religious order that opposes ours, lest their disaffection to us should be infused into their masters, and they propagate it among the provinces and cities where we reside. And if ever ambassadors of this kind pass through provinces or cities where we have colleges, let them be received with all due marks of honour and esteem, and as handsomely entertained as religious decency can possibly admit of. Chapter 4 the chief things to be recommended to preachers, and confessors of noblemen. 1. Let the members of our society direct princes and great men in such a manner, 
that they may seem to have nothing else in view but the promotion of God's glory, and advise them to no other austerity of conscience, but what they themselves are willing to comply with, for their aim must not, immediately, but by degrees and insensibly, be directed towards political and secular dominion. 2. We must therefore often inculcate into them that honours and preferments in the state should always be conferred according to the rules of justice, that God is very much offended that princes, when they anyways derogate from this principle, and are hurried away by the impulse of their passions. In the next place, our members must with gravity protest, and in a solemn manner affirm that the administration of public affairs is what they with reluctance interfere in, and that the duty of their office obliges them often to speak such truths as they would otherwise omit. When this point is once gained, care must be taken to lay before them the several virtues persons should be furnished with, who are to be admitted into public employs, not forgetting slyly to recommend to them such as are sincere friends to our order, but this must be done in such a manner, as not immediately to come from us, unless the princes enjoin it, for it may be effected with a far better grace by such as are their favourites and familiars. 3. Wherefore, let the confessors and preachers belonging to our order, be informed by our friends of persons proper for every office, and above all, of such as are our benefactors, whose names let them always carefully keep by them, that when proper opportunities occur, they may be palmed upon the prince by the dexterity of our members, or their agents. 4. Let the confessors and preachers always remember, with complaisance and a winning address, to soothe princes, and never give them the least offence in their sermons or private conversations, to dispossess their minds of all imaginary doubts and fears, and exhort them principally to faith, hope, and political justice. 5. Let them seldom or never accept of small presents for their own private use, but rather recommend the common necessities of the province or college. At home, let chambers plainly furnished content them, and let them not appear in showy dresses, but be ready at every turn to administer their ghostly advice to the meanest person about the palace, lest they give others occasion to believe, they are willing to be helpful to none but the great. 6. Immediately upon the death of any person in post, let them take timely care to get some friend of our society preferred in his room, but this must be cloaked with such cunning and management, as to avoid giving the least suspicion of our intending to usurp the prince's authority, for this reason, as has been already said, we ourselves must not appear in it, but make a handle of the artifice of some faithful friends for effecting our designs, whose power may screen them from the envy which might otherwise fall heavier upon the society. Chapter 5 what kind of conduct must be observed towards such religious persons as are employed in the same ecclesiastical functions with us? 1. We must not be discouraged or beat down by this sort of men, but take proper opportunities, demonstrably to convince princes and others in authority, who are any way attached to our interest, that our order contains the perfection of all others, excepting only their cant and outward austerity of life and dress, but if another order should claim preeminence in any particular, that it is ours which shines with the greatest luster in the Church of God. 2. Let the defects of other religious orders be diligently canvassed and remarked, and, after full discovery, gradually published to our faithful friends, but always with prudence and a seeming sorrow, and let it be pretended, that it is not in their power to acquit themselves so happily as we, even in the discharge of those functions which are common to us both. 3 but far greater efforts must be made against those, who attempt setting up schools for the education of youth, in places where any of our members do the same already with honour and advantage. And in this case, princes and magistrates must be told, that such, unless timely prevented, will certainly prove nurseries of tumults and sedition, for children, from different methods of instruction, must necessarily imbibe different principles, and lastly, we must persuade them, that no society but ours is qualified for discharging an office of so great importance. 4. And should these religious orders procure license from the Pope, or obtain recommendations from cardinals, our members must oppose these by the interest of princes and noblemen, who should inform His Holiness of the merits of our society, and its capacity for the peaceful education of youth, and let this be corroborated by testimonies from the magistrates of the place, concerning the good behaviour and faithful instruction of such as are committed to our care. 5. In the meantime, let our members be mindful to give the public some signal instances of their virtue and learning, by directing their pupils in the presence of the gentry, magistrates, and populace, in their several studies, or engaging them in the performance of some other scholastic exercises proper for gaining public applause. 
Chapter 6. Of Proper Methods for Inducing Rich Widows to be Liberal to Our Society. 1. For the managing this affair, let such members only be chosen as are advanced in age, of a lively complexion and agreeable conversation, let these frequently visit such widows, and the minute they begin to show any affection towards our order, then is the time to lay before them the good works and merits of the society, if they seem kindly to give ear to this, and begin to visit our churches, we must by all means take care to provide them confessors, by whom they may be well admonished. Especially to a constant perseverance in their state of widowhood, and this, by enumerating and praising the advantages and felicity of a single life, and let them pawn their faiths, and themselves too as a security, that a firm continuance in such a pious resolution, will infallibly purchase an eternal merit, and prove a most effectual means of escaping, the otherwise certain pains of purgatory. 2. And let the same confessors persuade them to engage in beautifying some chapel or oratory in their own houses, as a proper place for their daily meditations and devotions, by this means, they will be more easily disengaged from the conversation and address of importunate suitors, and although they have a chaplain of their own, yet never let the confessors desist from celebrating Mass, nor on all occasions giving them proper exhortations, and to be sure, if possible, to keep the chaplain under. 3. Matters which relate to the management of the house, must be changed insensibly, and with the greatest prudence, regard being had to person, place, affection and devotion. 4. Care must be taken to remove such servants particularly, as do not keep a good understanding with the society. But let this be done by little and little, and when we have managed to work them out, let such be recommended as already are, or willingly would become our creatures, thus shall we dive into every secret, and have a finger in every affair transacted in the family. 5. The confessor must manage his matters so, that the widow may have such faith in him, as not to do the least thing without his advice, and his only, which he may occasionally insinuate to be the only basis of her spiritual edification. 6. She must be advised to the frequent use and celebration of the sacraments, but especially that of penance, because in that she freely makes a discovery of her most secret thoughts, and every temptation. In the next place, let her frequently communicate, and apply for instructions to her confessor, to the performance of which, she must be invited by promises of some prayers adapted to her particular occasions, and lastly, let her every day rehearse the litany, and strictly examine her conscience. 7. It will be also a great help to the obtaining a perfect knowledge of all her inclinations, to prevail with her to repeat a general confession, although she has formally made it to another. 8. Discourses must be made to her concerning the advantages of the state of widowhood, the inconveniences of wedlock, especially when it is repeated, and the dangers to which mankind expose themselves by it, but of above all, such as more particularly affect her. 9. It will be proper, every now and then, cunningly to propose to her some match, but such a one, be sure, as you know she has an aversion to, and if it be thought that she has a kindness for any one, let his vices and failings be represented to her in a proper light, that she may abhor the thoughts of altering her condition with any person whatsoever. 10. When therefore it is manifest, that she is well disposed to continue a widow, it will then be time to recommend to her a spiritual life, but not a recluse one, the inconveniences of which must be magnified to her, but such a one as Paul as or Eustachius is, and Amp, C. And let the confessor, having as soon as possible prevailed with her to make a vow of chastity, for two or three years at least, take due care to oppose all tendencies to a second marriage, and then all conversation with men, and diversions even with her near relations and kinsfolks must be forbid her, under pretense of entering into a stricter union with God. As for the ecclesiastics, who either visit the widow, or receive visits from her, if they all cannot be worked out, yet let none be admitted but what are either recommended by some of our society, or our dependence upon them. 11. When we have thus far gained our point, the widow must be, by little and little, excited to the performance of good works, especially those of charity, which however, she must by no means be suffered to do, without the direction of her ghostly father, since it is of the last importance to her soul, that her talent be laid out with a prospect of obtaining spiritual interest, and since charity ill applied, often proves the cause and incitement to sins which effaces the merit and reward that might otherwise attend it. Chapter 7. How such widows are to be secured, and in what manner their effects are to be disposed of. 1. 
they are perpetually to be pressed to a perseverance in their devotion and good works, in such manner, that no week pass in which they do not, of their own accord, lay somewhat apart out of their abundance, for the honor of Christ, the blessed Virgin, or their patron saint, and let them dispose of it in relief of the poor, or in beautifying of churches, till they are entirely stripped of their superfluous stores, and unnecessary riches. 2. But if, besides their general acts of beneficence, they show a particular liberality to us, and continue in a course of such laudable works, let them be made partakers of all the merits of the society, and favored with a special indulgence from the provincial, or even from the general, if their quality be such as may in some measure demand it. 3. If they have made a vow of chastity, let them, according to our custom, renew it twice a year, and let the day whereon this is done, be set apart for innocent recreations with the members of the society. 4. Let them be frequently visited, and entertained in an agreeable manner, with spiritual stories, and also diverted with pleasant discourses, according to their particular humors and inclinations. 5. They must not be treated with too much severity in confession, lest we make them morose and ill-tempered, unless their favor be so far engaged by others, that there is danger of not regaining it, and in this case, great discretion is to be used in forming a judgment of the natural inconstancy of women. 6. Good management must be used, to prevent their visiting the churches of others, or seeing their feasts, but especially those of religious orders, for which purpose, let them hear it often repeated, that all the indulgences of other orders are with greater extent contained in ours. 7. If they propose to put on a weed, give them the liberty of such a becoming dress as has in it an air both religious and fashionable, that they may not think they are altogether to be governed by their spiritual guide. Lastly, if there be no suspicion of their inconstancy, but they are, on the contrary, faithful and liberal to our society, allow them in moderation, and without offense, whatever pleasures they have an inclination to. 8. Let women that are young, and descended from rich and noble parents, be placed with those widows, that they may, by degrees, become subject to our directions, and accustomed to our method of living, as a governess to these, let some woman be chosen and appointed by the family confessor, let these submit to all the censures, and other customs of the society, but such as will not conform themselves, immediately dismiss to their parents, or those who put them to us, and let them be represented as untractably stubborn, and of a perverse disposition. 9. Nor is less care to be taken of their health and recreations than of their salvation, wherefore if ever they complain of any indisposition, immediately all fasting, canvas, discipline, and other corporeal penance must be forbidden, nor let them be permitted to stir abroad even to church, but be tended at home with privacy and care. If they secretly steal into the garden, or college, seem as if you knew it not, and allow them the liberty of conversation and private diversions with those whose company is most agreeable to them. 10. That the widow may dispose of what she has in favor of the society, set as a pattern to her, the perfect state of holy men, who having renounced the world, and forsaken their parents, and all that they had, with great resignation and cheerfulness of mind devoted themselves to the service of God. For the better effecting of this, let what is contained in the constitution and statutes of the society relating to this kind of renunciation, and forsaking of all things, be explained to them, and let several instances of widows be brought, who thus in a short time became saints, in hopes of being canonized, if they continued such to the end. And let them be apprised, that our society will not fail to use their interest at the court of Rome for the obtaining such a favor. 11. Let this be deeply imprinted on their minds, that, if they desire to enjoy perfect peace of conscience, they must, as well in matters temporal as spiritual, without the least murmuring, or inward reluctance, entirely follow the direction of their confessor, as one particularly allotted them by divine providence. 12. They must also be instructed upon every occasion, that their bestowing of alms to ecclesiastics, and even to the religious of an approved and exemplary life, without the knowledge and approbation of their confessor, is not equally meritorious in the sight of God. 13. Let the confessors take diligent care to prevent such widows as are their penitents, from visiting ecclesiastics of other orders, or entering into familiarity with them, under any pretense whatsoever, for which end, let them, at proper opportunities, cry up the society as infinitely superior to all other orders, of the greatest service in the Church of God, and of greater authority with the Pope, and all princes, 
and that it is the most perfect in itself, in that it discards all persons offensive or unqualified, from its community, and therefore is purified from that scum and dregs with which the monks are infected, who, generally speaking, are a set of men unlearned, stupid, and slothful, negligent of their duty, and slaves to their bellies. 14. Let the confessors propose to them, and endeavor to persuade them to pay small pensions and contributions towards the yearly support of colleges and professed houses, but especially of the professed house at Rome, nor let them forget the ornaments of churches, wax tapers, wine, and amp, c. things necessary in the celebration of the sacrifice of the Mass. 15. If any widow does not in her lifetime make over her whole estate to the society, whenever opportunity offers, but especially when she is seized with sickness, or in danger of life, let some take care to represent to her the poverty of the greatest number of our colleges, whereof many just erected have hardly as yet any foundation, engage her, by a winning behavior and inducing arguments, to such a liberality, as, you must persuade her, will lay a certain foundation for her eternal happiness. 16. The same art must be used with princes and other benefactors, for they must be wrought up to a belief, that these are the only acts which will perpetuate their memories in this world, and secure them eternal glory in the next, but should any persons out of ill will pretend to trump up the example of our Saviour, who had not whereon to lay his head, and from thence urge, that the society of Jesus ought to distinguish themselves by their poverty, in answer to such insinuations as these, we must seriously inculcate on the minds of all, that the state of the Church, being altered from what it was, and now changed into a monarchy, it cannot maintain its ground against mighty enemies, unless supported by great authority and power, and that it is that little stone which was foretold by the prophet, should be hewn out of the rock, and afterwards rise into a vast mountain. 17. Those who are inclined to acts of charity, and the adorning of temples, should be frequently told, that the height of perfection consists in withdrawing their affections from earthly things, thereby making Christ and his followers possessors of them. 18. But since our expectations must necessarily be less from widows that educate their children for the business of the world, we shall now proceed to lay down methods proper for preventing this inconvenience. Chapter 8. How widows' children are to be treated, that they may embrace religion, or a devoted life. 1. As it will behove the widows to act with resolution, so must we proceed with gentleness upon this occasion. Let the mothers be instructed to use their children harshly, even from their cradles, by plying them with reproofs and frequent chastisements, and amp, c. And when their daughters are near grown up to discretion, let them then especially be denied the common dress and ornaments of their sex, at all times offering up prayers to God, that he would inspire them with a desire of entering into a religious order, and promising them very plentiful portions, on condition they would become nuns, let them lay before them the many inconveniences attending every one in a married state, and those in particular which they themselves have found by woeful experience. Often lamenting the great misfortune of their younger years, in not having preferred a single life. And lastly, let them persist to use them in this manner, that their daughters may think of a religious state, being tired by leading such a life with their mothers. 2. Let our members converse familiarly with their sons, and if they seem fit for our turn, introduce them occasionally into the college, and let everything be shown with the best face, to invite them to enter themselves of the order, as the gardens, vineyards, country seats, and villas, where those of our society pass an agreeable life let them be informed of our travels into several parts of the world, of our familiarity with princes, and whatever else may be agreeable to youth. Let them see the outward neatness of our refectories and chambers, the agreeable intercourse we have one with another, the easiness of our rules, which yet has the promise of the glory of God, and lastly, the preeminence of our order above all others, not forgetting, amidst our discourses of piety, to entertain them also with pleasant and diverting stories. 3. Let us now and then, as if by divine inspiration, exhort them to religion in general, and then artfully insinuate the perfection and conveniences of our institution above others, and take care to set in a due light, both in public exhortations and private discourses, how heinous a crime it is to resist the immediate call of God, and lastly, let them be soothed to the performance of spiritual exercises, to determine them in the choice of such a state of life. 4. We must also take care to provide for these youths, tutors that are firmly attached to our interests, who must keep a strict eye over them, and continually exhort them to such a course of life, 
but should they seem reluctant, abridge them of some of their former liberties, that by such restraint they may become conformable. Let their mothers set forth the difficulties which the family labor under, and if, after all, they can not be brought of their own accord to desire admission into the society, send them to distant colleges belonging to the order, under the notion of keeping them closer to their studies, and from their mothers let them receive little countenance, but let our members make use of the most alluring behavior, that their affections may be brought over to us. Chapter 9. Of Increasing the Revenues of Our Colleges. 1. Never admit any person, if it can well be prevented, to his last degree, so long as he shall have an expectation of any estate falling to him, unless he has a brother in the society who is younger than himself, or some other important reasons require it, but above all things, and in every action, the increase of the society must be regarded, for ends known to the superiors, who in this point, no doubt, agree that, for the greater displaying of God's glory, the church, should be restored to its ancient splendor, by the perfect harmony of all its clergy. Wherefore let it frequently, in every place, be published, that the society consists partly of professors so very poor, that, excepting the daily arms of the faithful, they are entirely destitute of the common necessaries of life, and partly of others, poor indeed, but possessed of some little matters, by help whereof they subsist, being, neither for their studies, nor the duties they perform, an encumbrance to the people, as other mendicants are. Therefore let confessors of princes, and noblemen, widows and others, from whom our expectations may reasonably be large, with great seriousness inculcate this notion, that while we administer to them in divine and spiritual things, they at least should in return, contribute to us of their earthly and temporal, and let no opportunity ever be slipped of receiving from them whatever is offered, and if anything be promised, and the performance delayed, take care to remind them thereof with prudence, and in such a manner as may best conceal our love of riches. But should any confessor, either of noblemen or others, seem the least negligent to put in practice these rules, let him, at a proper opportunity, be removed, and put another more fit in his room and should it be necessary, for the greater satisfaction of the penitents, let him be sent to one of the most distant colleges, saying, that a person of his ability, would be there of much greater service to the society for we have lately been informed that several young widows, being snatched away by sudden death, did not bequeath to us their valuable effects through the negligence of some members who did not take care to accept of them in due time, for in getting these things, regard is not to be had to the time, but the good inclination of the penitent. 2. Let various wiles be used to draw prelates, canons, pastors, and other rich ecclesiastics, to the exercise of spiritual acts, that through their affection for holy things, we may gradually gain them to the society, and by that means promise ourselves to be in some measure partakers of their liberality. 3. Confessors must remember to sift out of their penitents, at proper opportunities what family, relations, parents, friends and effects they have, then learn their reversions, state, intention, and resolution, which they must endeavor to mold in favor of the society, if it be not so already. If, at first trial, we have prospect of advantage, it being improper to pry into all things at once, let the same confessor, under pretense of better clearing their conscience, or doing some soul-saving penance, strictly enjoin them to make weekly confessions, and gravely, and with a seeming honest intention, invite them to it, that he may have the better opportunity to propose the questions, at several times, which he could not so conveniently offer at once. The matter succeeding according to his wish, if it be a female penitent, let always be tried to induce her to persist in frequent confessions, and constant attendance on the service of the church, if a male, to frequent the company of the members of our society, and to endeavor to enter into a familiarity with them. 4. What has been said, in relation to widows, must be made use of towards merchants, rich citizens, and married people who are childless, whose entire estates the society may often acquire, provided these rules be prudently put in practice, but, chiefly they must be observed with respect to rich female devotees, who often converse with our members, upon whose account the common people can but grumble at most, unless they happen to be descended from very noble families. 5. Let the rectors of colleges endeavor to procure thorough information, of the houses, gardens, farms, vineyards, villages, and other effects, belonging to the prime nobility, merchants and citizens, and, if possible, of the taxes and rents with which they are encumbered, but this may be done with caution, and most effectually at confessions, in familiar conversation, 
and private discourses. And whenever a confessor has got a rich penitent, let him immediately inform the rector, and try all ways of making himself agreeable. 6. But the whole success of our affairs turns chiefly on this point, viz. that all our members, by studying a compliance with every one's humor, work themselves into the good graces of their penitents, and others they converse with, to which end, where places are inhabited by the rich and noble, there let the provincials take care to send a considerable number, and that they may perform this with more prudence and success, let the rectors not omit giving them full instructions, as occasion requires, what a plentiful harvest is like to crown their endeavors. 7. Let inquiry be made, whether, by taking their children into the order, their contracts and possessions may fall to the society, and if so, whether, should they enter into an agreement with us, any part of their effects could be made over to the college in such a manner, that it may, after a limited time, revert unto us, and for the better success in this affair, let the necessities of the society, and the load of debts they labor under, be particularly represented to the nobility and those that are rich. 8. If it happen that the widows and rich married people, who are our friends, have daughters only, let these be persuaded by our members to make choice of a religious life, that, a small fortune being left to them, the society may, by degrees, get the rest into their possession and if they have sons who are fit for our turn, let them be allured to us, and the others be enticed, by the promise of small rewards, to enter themselves of different orders. But should there be an only son, let no means be omitted for the bringing him over to the society, and freeing him from all fear of his parents, let him be persuaded it is a call from above, and shown how acceptable a sacrifice it would be to God, should he desert his parents without their knowledge or consent, if this be effected, let him enter his novitiate in a remote college, having first given information to the general. But if they happen to have both sons and daughters, let the daughters be first disposed of in a nunnery, and afterwards let the sons be drawn into the society when they are got into possession of their sister's effects. 9. Let superiors earnestly, but with mildness, advise the confessors of such widows and married people, to apply themselves industriously for the service of the society, according to the instructions before laid down, but if they will not act conformable thereto, let others be substituted in their places, and they removed a good way off, to prevent them from keeping up the least correspondence with any of the family. 10. Let the widows or other devotees, who seem with fervency to aspire at spiritual perfection, be brought to give up all they have to the society, and be contented to live upon such allowance as we from time to time shall think they have occasion for, that, by easing their minds of the cares and anxieties of worldly affairs, they may be more at liberty for the service of God. 11. The better to convince the world of the society's poverty, let the superiors borrow money on bond, of some rich persons who are our friends, and when it is due, defer the payment thereof. Afterwards let the person who lent the money, especially in time of dangerous sickness, be constantly visited, and by all methods wrought upon to deliver up the bond, by this means, we shall not be mentioned in the deceased's will, and yet gain handsomely, without incurring the ill will of their heirs. 12. It will also be proper to borrow money of some at a yearly interest, and dispose of it to others at a higher rate, that the income on one hand may more than answer the outgo on the other. For in the meantime, it may happen, that our friends, to whom we are indebted, compassionating the necessities of the society, when they find us engaged in erecting of colleges, or building of churches, may, by will, or donation in their lifetimes, forgive us the interest, and may be, the principal. 13. The society may also advantageously traffic under the borrowed names of some rich merchants, our friends, but never without a prospect of certain and abundant gain, and this may be done even to the Indies, which hitherto, by the bountiful favor of God, have furnished us not only with souls, but also plenteously supplied our coffers with wealth. 14. In whatever places our members reside, let them never omit to provide a physician who is firm to the interest of the society, him let them recommend to the sick, and prefer before all others, that he, in return, by extolling our society above all other religious orders, may occasion us to be called to all persons of distinction, when afflicted with sickness, but chiefly to such as are past hopes of recovery. 15. Let the confessors be constant in visiting the sick, but especially such as are thought to be in danger, and that the ecclesiastics and members of other orders may be discarded with a good pretense, let the superiors take care that when the confessor is obliged to withdraw, others may immediately succeed, 
and keep up the sick person in his good resolutions. At this time it may be advisable to move him by apprehensions of hell, and amp, c. at least of purgatory, and tell him, that as fire is quenched by water, so sin is extinguished by acts of charity, and that arms can never be better bestowed, than for the nourishment and support of such who by their calling profess a desire to promote the salvation of their neighbor, thus will the sick become partakers of our merit, and by it atone for the sins they have committed, for charity covers a multitude of sins. This virtue may be also represented to them as that wedding garment, without which no one is admitted to the heavenly feast. Next let some passages be quoted out of the sacred writ, and holy fathers, which, regard being had to the sick person's capacity, shall be judged most proper for persuading him to a compliance. 16. Lastly, let the women who complain of the vices or ill humor of their husbands, be instructed secretly to withdraw a sum of money, that by making an offering thereof to God, they may expiate the crimes of their sinful helpmates, and secure a pardon for them. Chapter 10. Of the private rigor of discipline in the society. 1. Whoever hath alienated our female devotees or other friends, from our churches or frequent converse with our members, whoever hath withdrawn arms to other churches or orders themselves, or persuaded the rich and well inclined to us, to do it, whoever, at the time of disposal of their effects, hath shown a greater affection to their near relations, than to the society, a plain demonstration of an unmortified mind, and directly contrary to the thorough mortification enjoined on professors. Whoever hath converted the arms of penitents, or of other our friends, to the use of their own necessitous kinsfolks, let them all be discarded, as enemies to the society, of what age or condition soever they be, yet for this, let some other pretense be alleged. But to prevent their making complaint of this usage, let them not be expelled immediately, but first be restrained from hearing confessions, be plagued and perplexed with exercise of the most servile offices, be obliged to perform such duties, to which it is evident they have an utter aversion, let them be removed from higher studies and honorable employs, and harassed with chapters and public censures, let them be debarred of recreations, and conversation with strangers, and be denied. In dress and everything else, whatever is not absolutely necessary, till by such rigorous methods of chastisement, they become impatient, and murmur against us, let them then be dismissed, as persons not duly mortified, whose bad example may be pernicious to others, and if the reason of their expulsion be required by their parents, or the prelates of the church, let them be represented as not having the true spirit of the society. 2. Let such also be dismissed, who make a scruple of acquiring riches for the society, and set forth as persons too much in love with their own opinions and if they desire to give an account of their actions before the provincials, let them not be heard, but compelled to conform themselves to the statute, which commands implicit obedience from all. 3. Let us observe, from the first entrance, and even from their tender years, who they are that make the greatest advances in their affection for us and let such as are found to retain a love, either for other orders, the poor, or their parents, be, by little and little, disposed for dismission, according to the method already mentioned, since they are not likely to prove of any service to the society. Chapter 11. How our members are unanimously to behave towards those who are expelled the society. 1. Since those that are dismissed, do frequently very much prejudice the society, by divulging such secrets as they have been privy to, their attempts must therefore be obviated in the following manner. Let them be prevailed upon, before they are dismissed, to give it under their hands, and swear, that they never will, directly or indirectly, either write or speak anything to the disadvantage of the order, and let the superiors keep upon record, the evil inclinations, failings and vices, which they, according to the custom of the society, for discharge of their consciences, formally confessed, this, if ever they give us occasion, may be produced by the society, to the nobility and prelates, as a very good handle to prevent their promotion. 2. Let it be immediately published through all our colleges, that such and such are dismissed, and let the general causes of their expulsion, such as an unmortified mind, disobedience, disaffection for spiritual exercises, an obstinate adherence to their own opinions, and amp, c, be highly aggravated. In the next place, let all be advised to keep no correspondence with them upon any account whatsoever. And if strangers should happen to make any mention of them, let all our members unanimously affirm, in every public place, that the society expels none without weighty causes, spewing out, as the sea, all its dead carcasses, and amp, sea.
and let such causes also be artfully insinuated, which have occasioned us any ill will, that their ejectment may appear to the world with a more commendable grace. 3. In private exhortations, at people's houses, let these be represented as persons very turbulent, and continually importuning a readmission into the society. And let their sad fate be industriously aggravated, who, after exclusion, have happened to come to an untimely or miserable end. 4. Whatever accusations these bring against us, let them be appugned by the authority of some grave members, who must everywhere declare that the society dismisses none but upon very good reasons, nor ever lops off members that are sound, this must be confirmed by the zeal and concern we show for the souls of all strangers in general, how much greater must it therefore be for those who are members of our order. 5. In the next place, let the society, by all manner of obligations, endeavour to prevail upon the noblemen and panprelates, with whom the dismissed may have any credit or authority, to deny them their countenance, and let it be shown that the common good of an order, which is as famous as it is useful to the church, should always be preferred to the private advantage of any particular person whatsoever, and should they still retain an affection for them. It will then be of importance to lay open the causes of their expulsion, and even to aggravate them with those we have no positive proof of, so they can but be deduced by probable consequence. 6. Let all possible care be taken to hinder the promotion of such to offices and preferments in the church, who of their own accord have relinquished the society, unless they submit themselves, and all they have in the world, to our disposal, in such a manner, that it may plainly appear to everyone, they are willing to have their whole dependence on us. 7. Let them, as far as possible, be timely removed from the exercise of honourable functions in the church, such as preaching, confessing, and publishing of books, and amp, c. Lest by these means they attract the affection and applause of the people. The strictest inquiries must therefore be made into their lives, manners, and conversation, what they apply themselves to, and their very intentions, to which end, matters must be so managed, that we may keep up a good correspondence with some of the family in which they live, and the minute the least trip be discovered, or anything deserving censure, let it be industriously spread abroad in the world, by some of the lower rank of people, who are our friends. That so the noblemen or prelates may be restrained from showing them any further countenance, for fear of the scandal it may bring upon themselves. Should they behave so as to leave us no room to find fault, let their virtues and laudable actions, be depreciated by subtle insinuations, and doubtful expressions, till the esteem and credit they had formerly acquired, be lessened in the opinion of the world, for it is altogether for the interest of the society, that the dismissed, especially such as of their own accord deserted, should be entirely kept under. 8. Let the misfortunes, and unlucky accidents, which happen to them, be immediately published, but with entreaties for the prayers of good Christians, that the world may not think we are hurried away by passion, but, among our members, let these things, by all means, be represented in the blackest colours, that the rest may be better secured. Chapter 12. Who should be kept, and favoured in the society? 1. Let diligent labourers, whose industry is equally bent on promoting the temporal, as the spiritual interest of the society, be always held in the greatest esteem, of which sort are, generally speaking, confessors of princes and noblemen, of widows and rich female devotees, preachers, professors, and whoever are privy to these secret instructions. 2. The impaired in strength, and decrepit with age, must be next considered, according as they have employed their several talents for the temporal advantage of the society, that a grateful regard may be shown to their past labours, and because they may also, remaining always at home, be made use of, to pry into the actions of the other domestics and communicate to the superiors a faithful account of whatever miscarriages they shall be guilty of. 3. These should scarce ever be dismissed, lest we bring an ill reputation upon the society. 4. Besides these, let all be caressed, who are distinguished either for their parts, nobility, or riches, especially if they have friends or relations who affirm to our interests, possessed of power, and have given convincing proofs of a sincere affection towards us, according to the method before laid down. Let these be sent to Rome, or some other famous universities, to prosecute their studies, but if their inclinations lead them to do this in the province, let them be encouraged by the particular affection and favour of the professors, till they have surrendered to us their effects, let nothing be denied them, but when once we have got them to do this, 
oblige them then to mortification, like the rest, but not without having a little regard to their past beneficence. 5. That the superiors also show a particular respect to such as have allured any clever youths into the society, since this is no trifling testimony of their affection for us, but till these are professed, care must be taken not to give those too great indulgence, for fear they should carry away again those very persons they brought to us. Chapter 8. How to pick out young men to be admitted into the society, and in what manner to retain them. 1. Let us endeavor, with the utmost prudence, to pick out young men, of a good genius, an agreeable personage, a noble family, or at least such as excel in some one of these. 2. That they may, with greater ease, be drawn to us, let the masters, who have the care of their instruction, both during, and also after school time, by particular mildness, prepossess them in our favor, and insinuate how acceptable an offering it is to the Almighty, when any one dedicates himself, and all that he has, to him, especially in the society of his son. 3. At proper opportunities, let them be entertained in our colleges and gardens, and sometimes at our country seats, let them accompany our members at times of recreation, and by little and little be drawn into a familiarity, but however, with such proper cautions as may prevent its breeding in them contempt. 4. Let not their masters be allowed to chastise, nor keep them in subjection as the other scholars. 5. Let them be allured, by little presents, and indulgement of liberties agreeable to their age, and, above all, let their affections be warmed with spiritual discourses. 6. Let it be inculcated, that their being chosen out of such a number, rather than any of their fellow collegiates, is a most pregnant instance of divine appointment. 7. On other occasions, but especially in exhortations, let them be terrified with denunciation of eternal punishment, unless they accept of the heavenly invitation. 8. The more earnestly they desire admission into our society, the longer let the grant of such favor be deferred, provided, at the same time, they seem steadfast in their resolution, but if their minds appear to be wavering, let all proper methods be used for the immediate fixing of them. 9. Let them be strictly cautioned, not to make the least discovery of their call to any intimate friends, nor even so much as to their parents, before they are become one of us, that if afterwards any temptation to fall off, arises, both they and the society will be wholly at their liberties, and should we get the better of such inclinations, it will always be a handle, from their past irresolution, to stir them up to a firmer perseverance for the future, if this happens while they are novices, or after they have made but simple vows. 10. But since the greatest difficulty occurs in drawing in the sons of noblemen, persons of distinction, and senators, whilst they are under the wing of their parents, who endeavor to train them up to succeed in their employments, let our friends, rather than the members, persuade them to send their children into other provinces, and remote universities, wherein some of our order are tutors, private instructions, concerning their quality and condition, being first transmitted, that they may be the better enabled. By touching upon right strings, to secure their affection to the society. 11. When they are more advanced in age, let them be enticed, to the performance of some spiritual exercises, this method having been attended with very good success among the Germans and Polanders. 12. In troubles and afflictions we must administer comfort to every one according to their several qualities and conditions, by laying before them how often riches are a curse to the possessors, and privately exhort them not to contemn the call of God, the doing which exposes the offender to no less a penalty than that of hellfire. 13. That parents may more readily condescend to their sons' desires of becoming members of our society, it will be highly expedient to extol the excellence of its institution, in comparison of that of all other orders, the sanctity and learning of our brethren, the unspotted character they maintain among all, and the universal honor and applause they meet with everywhere, from persons of all qualities and degrees. Let an enumeration be made of the princes and noblemen, who, to the great comfort of their souls, lived in the society of Jesus, and are dead, and yet live. Let us show that nothing is more pleasing to God, than that young men should devote themselves entirely to him, especially as companions in the society of his son, and that it is one of the greatest felicities, for a man, from his youth, to bear the yoke of the Lord, but if any difficulties be started, by reason of the tenderness of their age, let the easiness of our institution be explained, which contains nothing in it very difficult to be observed, 
except the keeping of three vows, and, which is very remarkable, not any one rule, whose non-observance would be the commission even of a venial sin. Chapter 14. Of Reserved Cases, and Causes of Dismission from the Society. 1. Besides the cases already mentioned in our statutes, in which the superior only, or the ordinary confessor, by his authority, has power to absolve, there are others, namely, sodomy, effeminacy, fornication, adultery, uncleanness, unseemly commerce with man or woman, the commission also of any heinous offence against the society, its honour or interest, whether through zeal or otherwise, all which also are just causes of expulsion. 2. But if any one of the sacrament confesses sins of this kind, till promise be made, out of confession to discover them to the superior, either himself, or by his confessor, let not absolution be given him, and then let the superior take such resolutions as shall tend most, to the common good of the society, but if there be hopes of smothering the crime, let it then be punished with an adequate penance, but if not, let him, as soon as possible, be expelled, let the confessor however be always very cautious, not to inform the penitent that he is in danger of it. 3. If it come to the ear of any of our confessors, that a strange woman, has had to do with a member of the society, let her not be absolved before she has discovered his name, out of confession, and even when this is done, let her by no means receive absolution till she has further obliged herself, by an oath, never to reveal it to any one living without our consent. 4. If two of our members have carnally sinned, let the first that discovers it, be retained, and the other expelled, but let him that stays with us be mortified and plagued with such intolerable discipline, that we may drive him to the commission of some fresh offence, which will afford a good handle for spewing him out, and the first time it offers, be sure to lay hold on it. 5. As the society is a body, both noble and excellent in the church, it has authority to lop off such members, who though at their entrance they might seem fit for our purpose, should afterwards prove unqualified for execution of our designs. To effect this, a method may easily be found, to wit, by continually using them hardly, and doing everything contrary to their inclinations, by subjecting them to severe superiors, and by forcing them from their more honourable studies and functions, till they begin to murmur against such usage. 6. Nor let such by any means be retained, as either openly oppose their superiors, or, in public or private, make complaints against them to their fellow members, but especially to strangers, or such as condemn, to their associates, or strangers, the conduct of the society in the amassing or management of temporal goods, or any other of our methods of proceeding, as for instance, our suppressing, and keeping under all either disaffected to, or expelled from, our order, and amp, c, or that admit in conversation, or defend the Venetians, French, or others, who by hindering us from getting a footing among them, have done the society intolerable damages. 7. Before the time of their dismission, let them be treated with the utmost severity, removed from their usual duties, and hurried about from one to another, and though they do whatever you task them, yet always find fault, and under this pretense remove them to some other. For the slyest offence, though inadvertently committed, be sure you subject them to a heavy punishment, in public, constantly abash them, till they are able no longer to bear it, and then turn them out, as persons whose example may be pernicious to others, and for this purpose choose place and opportunity, as they never in the least thought of. 8. If any of our order has certain expectations of a bishopric, or other ecclesiastical preferment, let him, besides the usual vows of the society, be obliged to make another, namely, that he will always entertain a favourable opinion, and on all occasions speak honourably of us, that he will never confess, but to one of our members, nor determine, in any affair of moment, without first consulting the judgment of the society, for non-observance of which by Cardinal Tollett, our order obtained from the Holy See. That no Maran, descended from the perfidious race of Jews or Mahometans, who will not oblige himself to perform such a vow, should ever, for the future, be admitted among us, but immediately expelled as a most virulent enemy, though a person of ever so great fame and reputation. Chapter 15. 15. Of our conduct towards nuns, and female devotees. 1. Let the confessors and preachers be very cautious of offending nuns, or of leading them into any the least temptation contrary to their calling, but, on the other hand, 
having by all means gained the affection of the governesses, let them manage so as at least to take their extraordinary confessions, and preach to them, if they find them forward in making grateful returns, for persons descended from noble families, especially rich abbesses, are capable of being very serviceable to us, either through their own, or the interest of their parents and friends, so that by currying favour with the principal monasteries, the society may by degrees get an acquaintance with, and work themselves into the friendship of, almost the whole city. 2. Yet, on the other side, let our female devotees be forbid to frequent nunneries, lest they should be most taken with that kind of life, and we thereby be balked in our expectations of what they have. But let them be induced, to the performance of their vow of chastity, and obedience, by the care of their confessor, by his showing them that such method of living, is conformable to the purity of the primitive church, being as a candle which diffuses its light through the whole house, and not hid under a bushel, and consequently contributing nothing to the edification of our neighbor, or the good of souls, and, like the good widows in the gospel, that they should communicate of their substance to Christ. By their bounty to his companions. Lastly, let every argument be applied which may create in them, an aversion to a recluse life, but let all these instructions be delivered to them under the strictest obligations to secrecy, lest other orders should happen to hear of them. Chapter 16. In what manner we must outwardly feign a contempt of riches. 1. Lest the seculars should represent us as too much hankering after riches, it will be proper now and then to refuse such small and trifling arms, as are offered for performance of pious offices, though of such as are thoroughly attached to our interest, we must readily accept whatever they give us, lest we bring upon ourselves the imputation of covetousness, for our swallowing nothing but presents of value. 2. Let burial in our churches be denied to persons of a base character, although, in their lifetimes, they have been ever so much our friends, lest the world should surmise that we hunt after riches, by the numbers of the deceased, and come to a knowledge of what we gain by them. 3. Let widows and others who have given us almost all they possessed, though then they are on equal foot with others, be treated with much more rigor, lest people should imagine, their greater indulgence proceeds from our hopes of secular advantages. The same method should be also observed with such as are in the society, but this must be after they have entirely given up all into our hands and if ever after there be a necessity for it, let them be dismissed, but this must be done with such discretion, that they may be induced to leave to the order, part at least of what they formerly gave us, or bequeath it by will, at the time of their death. Chapter 17. Of the methods of advancing the society. 1. Let our members chiefly endeavor at this, always to act with unanimity, even in things of trifling moment, or at least to have the outward appearance of doing so, for by this means, whatever confusions may arise in the world, the society, of necessity will always increase and maintain its ground. 2. Let all earnestly endeavor so to shine in their learning and good example, that other religious, especially those of the clergy, and amp, c. may be eclipsed, and the common people at length drawn in to request us to discharge every office. And let it be also publicly declared, that a very great fund of learning is not so absolutely necessary in pastors, provided in all other respects they discharge their duty as they ought, for the society can assist with advice on emergencies, for which reason it has good offices of this sort in a particular esteem. 3. Let kings and princes be kept up in this principle, that the Catholic faith, as matters how stand, cannot subsist without the civil power, which however must be managed with the greatest discretion. By this means our members will work themselves into the favor of persons in the highest posts of government, and consequently be admitted into their most secret councils. 4. It will be also proper to entertain their curiosity with the newest, choicest, and most genuine transcripts that can be purchased from all places. 5. Nor will it contribute a little to our advantage, if, with caution and secrecy, we ferment and heighten the animosities that arise among princes and great men, even to such a degree, that they may weaken each other. But if there appear any likelihood of reconciliation, then as soon as possible let us endeavor to be the mediators, lest others prevent us. 6. The nobility and populace must, by all methods, be persuaded into a belief, that the society was instituted by the particular direction of divine providence, according to the prophecies of the abbot Joachim, that by this means, the church, though depressed by the attempts of heretics, may be raised again to its primitive luster. 7. The favor of the nobility and superior clergy, 
once got, our next aim must be to draw all cures and canonships into our possession, for the more complete reformation of the clergy, who heretofore lived under the certain regulation of their bishops, and made considerable advances towards perfection. And lastly let us aspire to abbacies and bishoprics, the obtaining which, when vacancies happen, will very easily be effected, considering the supineness and stupidity of the monks, for it would entirely tend to the benefit of the church, that all bishoprics, and even the apostolical see, should be hooked into our hands, especially should his holiness ever become a temporal prince over all. Wherefore, let no methods be untried, with cunning and privacy, by degrees, to increase the worldly interests of the society, and then, no doubt, a golden age will go hand in hand with an universal and lasting peace, and the divine blessing of consequence attend the Catholic Church. 8. But if our hopes in this should be blasted, and since offences of necessity will come, our political schemes must be cunningly varied, according to the different posture of the times, and princes, our intimates, whom we can influence to follow our counsels, must be pushed on to embroil themselves in vigorous wars one with another, to the end, our society, as promoters of the universal good of the world, may, on all hands, be solicited to contribute its assistance. And always employed in being mediators of public dissensions, by this means the chief benefices and preferments in the church, will, of course, be given us by way of compensation for our services. 9. Finally, the society must endeavor to effect this at least, that having got the favor and authority of princes, those who do not love them, may at least fear them. The End